Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming on the Zoom with us tonight. And I just want to do a shout out to the Monmouth Museum. They've been so good to me. One of my first big shows was there many years ago. And then um, they gave me a commission with Hackensack Hospital where I did a big aluminum wall piece about water. And they've just been so great. It's such a great institution. So I do appreciate it. And I hope you all appreciate what, what a great place you have. So I thought I would start out tonight with some of the questions that Erica sent me that you had asked, because it by answering those questions, it incorporates really what I'm doing and what it's about. So the first one that I have was what led me to the birds. And um, if you haven't seen my work on the birds, I've done a lot of cutouts about missing birds and drawings about birds. Uh, this particular exhibition I put together because it was virtual, I thought it would be better to do the paintings and drawings as opposed to the installations, because it's very hard to see that unless you're standing in front of it. But what led me to the birds, I'll tell you a story. So I grew up in Evansville, Indiana, which is Southern Indiana on the Ohio River. And we spent a lot of time in the country and there was a tree in my front yard that I would climb when I was you know, mad at my mom or just had to get away. And I would sit up in that tree and look around and we swam in the stripper pits and we went out to the country. Unlike where I live now in the suburbs, it's tough to find the country. So I think that was the beginning of my inspiration of loving nature. And then I got a job at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and I was teaching there and it's very cold and the tree, it was a very linear landscape. And that was very exciting to me. It reminded me of abstract expressionism. And I, I was always looking and I did a lot of drawings about that. So then when I moved to New York and I met my husband and we moved to New Jersey and we moved into the suburbs, a neighbor cut down 21 mature trees to build an enormous house. And that really made me angry. And so I decided that I would do an installation about the missing trees. Because when you cut down all the trees, you deprive the birds of their shelter, of their food source, not to mention shade and controlling water runoff for the rest of us who live there. So my first piece was about the missing trees. And then I moved from that to the missing birds because there were quite a few birds endangered in New Jersey and basically in the Northeast, the migratory birds. So that's really what got me to the birds. And then I partnered with New Jersey Audubon and turned my yard into a native habitat. And what happened, what I mean is they came out because they do this for corporate campuses. They transform corp corporate campuses into native habitats. So they, re they survey my yard and test the soil and decide where I can plant certain plants that feed the birds, bees, and the butterflies. So after about two years, they all came in and I have this enormous native planting going on in my backyard, which I was looking at all the time from my kitchen, which became an inspiration for the work that you're seeing now, because I'm always out there. And it's, it taught me that nature is not neat it is not groomed, it is messy, it is layered, it is tangled, it is gestural, and the colors change constantly. So in my yard, um, I planted the native plants, then I mulch with leaves. So that creates another texture and it's very beautiful, the orange and the brown against the trees and trees are not straight. Mm -hmm. And we kept, when the trees um, get sick, we would cut part of them down, but leave the rest of it for the birds because they get bugs in the trees. So I like drawing those trees. So that's kind of where the inspiration came for a lot of this work that you're seeing tonight. <clears throat> but the birds came out of the fact that this neighbor, actually I should kiss this neighbor because he started me off on this whole a journey of painting about nature. Before that, I love landscape and I would do landscape painting, but in a more traditional way where you have foreground, middle ground, background. But my landscapes bring it right up front to the viewer so that you're almost in it. And that's important to me because I want you to see the beauty in the natural habitat to preserve it. That's what I'm really interested in is education and making people look at their yards again and limit some of the grass and maybe add some native plants to benefit the wildlife that, um, that needs that. Not to mention that the, beads, the bees need it and then they 
pollinate plants for us. So that's where that came from. And these paintings, um, this painting that you can see on the screen um, is made, was drawn with mud and ink. And I, it was as last summer. And these are some of the plants that are right out my window. And so I just put old Bon Jovi on and I just got out there and I just rocked all day with my mud and my ink. And because to me, the linear quality of my plants, it, it's like paint strokes. So that's where I was going with this. And then I like to limit the palette because um, I'm getting a value study because drawing, one of the questions was um, what techniques do I like or what material do I like to use? And I really love drawing the most. I think that was my classical training and I love all the materials you can use for drawing, including mud. So I use a lot of ink, I use a lot of charcoal, sometimes graphite. Um, I guess I like that better than paint, although I do like paint. I, I like all art supplies. Like that's, if, if, you, if I wanna go shopping, that's where I'd like to go shopping, to an art store and see what's new and what I can use. So let me see, I had one more that was, um, I forgot what the other one was. I, I wanna say, oh, this, I, I guess I really like winter because I noticed I gave you a lot of pieces that have to do with the grays and the, the dark, kind of um, somber palette. I am very influenced by movies, uh, the way they film the movie, the, I guess it's called the cinematography. Um, there's a movie, The Village. I don't know if you've seen The Village or The Revenant or uh, some, of, like, some of the jungle movies like Predator. All these movies, the camera work is up close, like when they're running through the woods. And Blair Witch was a huge influence on me. It was a handheld, um, uh, filming. And I was very interested in that because they were moving through all these sticks. It was very uncomfortable. And that goes back to my theme of nature is not neat. It is messy. It is a little bit scary. And it has the whole thing about death in it, you know, because things die and then they come back and it's just that whole cycle of life. I really am drawn to that. So this is one of those winter scenes. And then I added the bird feathers because you do see, if you walk in the woods, you do see remnants of animals. Sometimes it's a squirrel's tail because a fox got it or bird feathers. And that's interesting to me also. Um, I see beauty in all the seasons. Um, it's not just that green summer. I mean, that is really nice, but I think I'm more drawn to these linear statements. And also negative and positive space is a big thing for me. How you divide up the canvas because see, I came through college in the time when paint was to be recognized as paint. Pa paint strokes were important and they stood on their own and you were composing on this rectangle and you had to think about the surface geometry of the whole painting. So that sort of stuck with me. I mean, you, it's whatever you're brought up with, I guess. And that's how I was trained. So how do you combine that concept with landscape, which is a very old, and not always so respected uh, uh, way of, of seeing because it's always that deep English foreground, middle ground, background. So I was trying to think about that and how am I gonna reconfigure that idea for myself in my paintings? Um, and the way they do it in the movies is interesting to me. I, I think if I could start over again, I might've gone into film. I just didn't know about that because when I went to college, well, first of all, when I was in school and you're a woman, you were a nurse, a teacher, um, what other, not very many, a secretary, a mom, you know, and I just didn't know about film, especially coming from the Midwest. There just, there wasn't a lot of exposure and my parents didn't know. So I always loved art from the very beginning. As a child, my dad was in advertising and he would bring home uh, typewriter paper. I love that white paper. And I would go in with my, just with my crayons and I was always drawing. I love to make paper dolls. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember making your own paper dolls, but we did. And that was my favorite activity was just to draw or cut out. And now I'm doing a lot of collage, which is funny because it kind of comes back around as you get really old, then it comes back around. But I've always, always loved nature, playing in nature, sitting there, contemplating, wait. Somebody asking something. Um, one of the other questions was what advice I would give to artists. 
ah, that was hard. I had to think about that. Oh, this is a real winter scene. Doesn't that just fit for what's happening right now up here? Oof. I, I, this is a little bit of gesso and charcoal, which I like to combine. Um, anything to get the surface and to make the mark stand out. The trees, of course, and the negative, you can see the negative and positive space going on in this. And I sometimes I, I try to get to um, a very good friend of mine said, make your own landscape. And that has stayed with me. And I'm really working on that. Like instead of looking, like look long enough so that you memorize what you're seeing and you really take it in, inside and then make your own landscape. Because what, what I'm seeing is different from what someone else is seeing. So how do I say, what I'm seeing and that's what I'm working on now. And this is kind of one of those pieces. It didn't come from one, I didn't sit out in the snowstorm to you know, make this piece, but it came from a lot of drawings. I Drawing is the scaffolding for my work. It always has been. And that's how I was taught to see through drawing. And it was a pretty classical um, a foundation, but we pushed it because then Picasso was very big. So we pushed it into cubism and we pushed it into that flat space, Matisse, Picasso, Degas, Toulouse-Lautrec. Those were the people that, you know, we were growing up with. And then the real abstractionists came in. So then it became all about the surface and we had to think about that. So back to my advice to artists, I would say, practice your visual vocabulary, work really, really hard and try to find a job that can support your habit because it's an impossible career. Another thing that's really important is to find a community. You need people to talk to that can have, speak the same language that you speak. And that's really hard to do, especially if you're a woman married with children because you have three jobs. So I would say just don't give up, keep practicing and study your art history because everything is borrowed from something else. And so you want to steal as much as you can to put together to say what you wanna say about whatever it is you're drawing or painting about. Um, that's why I watch movies a lot. Sometimes I'll watch a movie and I'll turn off the sound and I'll just watch how they have staged it, what the composition is. And I, I make notes from that. Or sometimes I'll freeze it and photograph the image and then study that. So, I mean, there are many ways. Today, you have so much equipment. It's, it's So this piece is acrylic on paper. I have this large paper that I love that's 37 by 50, and I do a lot of uh, drawing on it. Most of my drawings are on this, and this just happens to have some acrylic paint, and I think maybe a little pastel. So sometimes when I just can't get the color, I just take that pastel and just put it right on top. And then it just whoosh, zooms, you know, I, I love pastel. The problem with pastel is that it's hard to frame because it's so fragile and you don't want it to stick to the um, acrylic and then you have to use glass and then it gets very heavy and then exhibition, they don't want the heavy piece being shipped. But again, we're out in the trees. I, I love those. If you really look at a tree, it's amazing what you'll see. Be, be, the bark texture, the little broken pieces of um, twigs, and it's all that tangled layered stuff that excites me. It's kind of like my personality. It's very gestural and high strung. My mother always told me I was very high strung, but I thought that was a good energy because that gets I get a lot done. I work all the time, by the way. Um, I go to the studio if I can every day for about five hours. As I've gotten older, I can't stand as long as I used to but I used to work all day long because you have to keep practicing. It's like a musical instrument. If you don't, then you get rusty and your line isn't as expressive as it should be, or you go back to your bad habits. You, you have to keep pushing through to keep the, the vibrancy and the originality because what I'm looking for is the authenticity of nature and it's different in different places. Like it's a whole different scene in Florida as opposed to New England or the Southwest. And that's exciting to me. So a lot of, most of these were done up here, but um, this, this is only ink, ink. And this is a smaller piece and it's ink and um, watered down ink and ink. I like to draw with those uh, Japanese sticks or sometimes just a stick from the woods that I shave into a point, it makes a nice line. Um, 
I like it because the line stops on its own and then you can't mess it up. So you have to go back and dip it back in the ink and then go back to it because the line kind of speaks to me as opposed to a pen that has an even, you know, a pen, if you're drawing with a pin tail or something, it's an even line. And then that lends itself more to cross hatching for me, which I do a lot of in smaller drawings. I don't think I have any here, but I like this gestural mark making because it's kind of the essence of what the woods is um, and the darks and the lights as opposed to um, tr transcribing just what a photo sees. And that's the other thing, I don't work from photos. I use photos for some reference, but I try to draw as much as I can and then put it together afterward because the photo is already editing the place and I need to do the editing, not allow the camera to edit it. So, I mean, it's just, it's just not a good idea in the beginning. I think after you've been in this field for a long time, yeah, then you can maybe work from a photo because you know what to do with what you're trying to express. So I, I don't, I try not to do that. I do take a lot of photos of the woods and I look at them just for compositional things, but not for color and not for value necessarily. Sometimes I'll take a photo and run it through my um, printer and print it out in black and white. It's a color photo, but I'll print it out in black and white to see if there is any value change in it. And then sometimes I cut them up and recollage them into another one. So it gets, they, they go through a lot of stages, but what I love is like on the right side of this, you see those ink marks on top of the light value and the white around it, I love that. <laughs> So it's like, to me, a good chocolate chip cookie. I don't know. It's like, you can change it, Erica, if you want the image. Yeah, this one's a little darker and um, moody. Uh, cool, cold, moody. This is acrylic paint on paper. I like to work that way, although I'm finding that for sale purposes, it's better if it's on canvas. And canvas has always been a little bit of an issue for me because it gives when I put the mark down and I like it to be, the paper doesn't move, if you understand what I mean. So I'm trying to translate some of these onto canvas now because I think it's better if you sell it that the buyer can walk away holding the canvas as opposed to having to go to the framer and frame it. Um, sometimes that's just an issue for people. They don't know what to do. so. Um, and it's also more fragile. It can tear. I mean, you can roll it to ship it. That's true. But anyway, this, this is more about the color and the mood of the place. And I also, again, like those trees up in front in my face, because when I was a child and I sat in that tree, you know, the branches are all around you. There was something about that. It was very cozy and comforting. And I watch a lot of those um, crazy reality shows about Alaska. And I can, I imagine myself living in those places and how cold it is and what they're seeing. I, and the, that landscape that's untouched, I love that. Not that I paint a lot of snow scenes, but lately I have been because it's, it's been so much snow. So I've been drawing for, since COVID hit, I've been drawing at home out my window, the same, reinventing the same thing I'm seeing out my window, which is kind of a good exercise. It, it really pushes your mind in your hand. I don't have those drawings right here, but um, that's what I've been doing because I couldn't go anywhere. And I also cut up some old tablecloths and I I put them um, in the collages of them. What is Georgia saying? Discuss the vertical partition. What? What? Discuss the vertical partition. Uh, you yeah. often put trunks in the middle of the composition. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do, because it's right up in your face and it's a little bit scary, like what's behind it. And I like being part of the woods. So by standing right next to a tree, you and I'm also intrigued by the texture of the tree. And I just, I've always bring, because it brings the space forward. That's what I was saying. Instead of having this foreground that has nothing in it and then the middle ground and then the background far, far away, I like push it forward because it becomes more abstract that way and it blocks your view. I, I guess I like blocking your view, I don't know. <laughs> Does it ever seem like it's uh, protection? Could be, hadn't really thought about that, but that would make sense. Something to hide behind. 
maybe. I, I, I don't know. I, just, I don't either. I just know that it's a contrast of the big tree to the skinny one with the little dead, I like dead trees. Um, they have a lot of gestural content. But yeah, I have to. But they also have the solidity. Yes. And I like that it goes off the screen, off the canvas from the top to the bottom. I don't, I often do that um, because it brings it to the front plane instead of having it grounded in the, in the earth uh, far further away from you, which makes you more secure because you have space to move. I like that it just hits you in the face. Yeah. 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 I guess, <laughs> another one. Let's see if I really did that. I think I did on all of them. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. You know, the thing is when you're working, you don't always know exactly until it's finished and you have to write about it. You know, this is acrylic too. And I added a color to see, it's like a little bit of a dance in the woods. This was a, another idea, the white paint and acrylic. And then I just added this bizarre color just to give it a little color. I don't know why I did it, but it's a smaller piece. And I'm always looking at the grays of the color of the trees because they're not brown, they're not really gray, they're not black, but it's a, a mixture. And that's always been a struggle to find that. And I find that I tend to go towards purples and yellows somehow. And I even have a piece that I did in high school that was trees and that's exactly what I used. And so maybe I had, it wasn't my cataracts at that time. It might be my cataracts now, but the, the trees were always this complementary mixture of grays. I had to find it. That's interesting too, to me. But again, it's all about it being flat and how I divide up the space and this tangled gestural layered presence of nature, which in the suburbs, we don't seem to appreciate because we keep putting in too much grass and we cut bushes into balls and we make trees into lollipops because we don't want messiness. And I don't quite understand that. Um, it's so sterile and it also keeps the birds away. And in my yard, I have so many birds. They're there now eating the seeds because I leave my plants. I don't, um, what do you call it, prune them until the end of March. So they have seeds all winter and the fox comes. I have these little foxes that are in my backyard. I don't have any little dogs and I don't have any kids, so it's okay and I can watch them. And they sunbathe in the backyard, I guess they because it's safe there and it's so overgrown maybe. But the birds are there all year long, which is really nice and it's fun to watch them. And then I mulch with my leaves so that it gives nitrogen to the soil. And I mean, I still have grass in my front yard. I have grass, but it's, I would get rid of it probably, except that the neighbors won't mind. But I don't understand why we don't have more nature. And that's what's caused the deer to come into our yards because we've gotten rid of it all. And that worries me for the health of the planet. That's something that's really important to me. You can go to the next one. So this is summer, obviously summer and it's all about the greens and trying to get the greens and mixing the greens. So in a palette, if you're a painter and you're watching this, you know you have warm and cool colors and what is the light and what is the shadow and how do you mix those colors uh, to, because the, all the greens are mixed. They're not just out of the tube. Um, I guess they could be. A lot of painters today use very vivid, vivid colors, but I was trying to find the darkness and the lightness. And then again, the trees are coming from the top to the bottom. You're right. But this is a, a summer piece about the light and the greens and the lake behind it. Um, so, and the shapes and, I, and it's flat. It, it, it's still flat because I love Fairfield Porter and I love Neil Welliver and I love Lois Dodd and I love Alex Katz. And so all of those people when I was coming up through painting were important in terms of painting. So that's why it's like this, it's direct painting. And I did this on the spot right there in the woods. And it's, um, I think this is 37 by 50 on acrylic on paper. So I attach it to a piece of foam core and put it on the easel and get right to work mixing those paints. And I've discovered um, acrylic paint that stays 
moist longer. It's, I think it's called flow or I forgot. Um, Golden makes it and it doesn't, you know how acrylic paint dries up so fast, but this one stays a little bit more like oil, I, I, but not, but it stays moist, you know, and you can still get back to your mixture. So that's helpful, that's been helpful because when you're outside, things dry up really fast, especially the watercolor. And um, I don't like that because I, I have to move things around. I can I mean, I'm, I, I don't have it exactly planned out, because I'm responding to it directly. So sometimes you have to paint over, but this one seems pretty direct. I don't see any, I don't see any overpainting. <laughs> Do we have a new, another one, Erica? Is the screen still frozen? Okay, this is a watercolor out of my garage, looking right into my yard. Watercolor is tricky. Um, you really have to think it through and think about your layers. So with watercolor, it's generally light to dark. And I use a hair dryer if I wanna get it dry really fast, because if you don't, you're gonna blend it in and muddy it up right away. And you have to keep your palette really clean. And thinking how high strung that I work, you would think that wouldn't work for me, but it works It works for me somehow. Because I can't, I, ha I have to do those things. And when I do those things, then it stays clean. Bit. And then it's never what you think. And then you wait until it's dry. I usually work on maybe three at once. So I lay in the foundation of it. Then I come back and work into it slowly because it's never dark enough, but you don't want to get it to be muddy. So it's a few steps. And then you have to sit back and look at it. And then you can lay something on top of the whole thing, like the blue on the left side of this one. But I'm looking at this thinking the deer have eaten all of that. <laughs> it's not even like that anymore. Wow, that was in the summer. But I like to work, um, this is an oil painting and I don't do a lot of oil paintings, but this also was from summer out my garage. And this is an oil painting. And I just worked as directly as I could to get the feeling of what I was seeing. So I, I Oil painting scares me a little bit, so I don't do too much of it. And I think I'm allergic to it anyway, because I always get congested when I'm using oil paint. With acrylic, it's a little less um, terrifying. Painting is terrifying. But all those greens over there, are you with oil painting, you really have to pre-mix so you don't muddy up your paint and get it mixed up there on that palette. And uh, we were taught to mix it and then hold up the palette knife, squint one eye and look at it and see if you're close and get your values going. So that's time consuming. You have to get that together. Otherwise you think you're mixing something, but then it gets too thin and then it gets muddy on the canvas and it's not what you're going for at all. And I like to keep it very direct and spontaneous. So, and mark making, I like the gestural mark to show. So, but it, but to say treeness, treeness without being uh, literal. It, does that make sense? So, you want to go to another one in the context? Oh yeah, this is ink and ink and watercolor. Ink, yeah, ink and watercolor. I just felt like I needed a little cool blue in there, but I, I do. I love ink. So, and it's the same thing. I build it up to the darks and then maybe at the end, you lay in some kind of wash to pull it together if it's a little too messy for you, but it's the same. And there's the one tree that anchors it all kind of in there. But um, I don't know, it's a, a felt sense of, of place and the materials, I can be working on ink and then go over to the watercolor table. I, I just go back and forth. I don't do one thing straight away until it's finished. I'll do something and then move to something else and then think about it and then come back because the something else maybe inform me about this. So sometimes I'll cut them up. If they're not working, I'll cut them up and save the best parts of them and then collage them into something else. And then maybe do a painting from that. So there are a lot of steps that go on in the studio and there's a lot of work always floating around. Um, 
in the process until the thing is finished. And I never really, really know. You start with a place and a sense of it and sort of a climate and a gesture and then it starts to develop. And sometimes the way I develop one thing, I like it, so then I save that so I can remember, I'm gonna do those trees that way again. Because it takes a long time to get a feeling for the pine tree or the bush or the seeds or whatever. It's not what you think it is. So you have to get out of what you think it is and try to see it. And that takes a long time. That's where journaling comes in. It's really important to keep a notebook. I, I have a lot of journals and a lot of drawings. And sometimes those drawings get messed together or cut up or um, used in other pieces. So uh, when, when I was caring for my parents in my 40s, when they were both very sick and, and dying on hospice two days apart, I did a whole journal of both of them. I did drawings of them and that's a whole different series, but it was very helpful to me as I watched them pass away. But also, um, well, it's a body of work. And it's about nature and what happens to our bodies. And I tried to capture that gesture of the thinness and the withering away. And it was helpful for me because it's so horrific to see it happening in front of you and to sit there with your parents while they're on hospice. It was just soothing to draw them. So I have that body of work tucked away, but it, it feels like this sort of. It's the same because things decay and die and we're gonna die and it's just part of nature. And I, that was kind of a gift to see that part of nature because not everyone does. So I was really lucky to be with them towards at the end of their life. There's a little bit of um, darkness to my work that um, is always of interest to me. You wanna do another one? Oh, this is my little, my attempt at Fairfield Porter on a, on a, this is on a gesso board, which I hadn't used before, which is watercolor on a gesso board. And I kind of like the feeling of it. I intend to get some more of those, but it was about these four sections of foliage and how to put them together. And I kind of like mm -hmm. the way the ink, the watercolor mixed on it. It was a little different than the paper. It didn't absorb into it. So we made these sort of puddles of color. That was exciting. And then I go in with the, and sometimes I use a watercolor pencil to go in to make my line because if you, it, it makes a thinner line than the brush sometimes and um, more direct and more dense line. And then if you wanna blend it, you just go in with your brush and it's watercolor pencil. So it just explodes into the other color. So that's, that's always uh, something I discovered a couple of years ago. I didn't know about watercolor pencils. There's always something new at the art store that's really fun. That's like the best, the best present you can give me is a gift to the art store. And you just go in and, oh, I think I'll try this and I'll try this, you know. And sometimes it doesn't work out, but at least you learn something. You learn from all your mistakes. And then I, I look a lot at these little white negative spaces. Those are intriguing to me. And in my drawings, they sometimes come out as, uh, I actually go into them with white pastel, but in the watercolor, I try to leave it as the paper. So it's all about that negative positive interaction that's going on. You wanna do another one? And this was about how little, how less is more. Like, I don't wanna put down everything. I don't know why, but I sold this piece. So I guess she liked it. <laughs> Trees are a little straight for me, but it was an experiment. And it's acrylic on paper. And I really liked it, I don't know, it was just like, let's make these marks and then let's jung, jumble them up and make them. I'd been standing in that woods for a week. And so I kind of had it in my head where the emphasis would be. And that's how this, so it's really the ideas of abstraction, but using something I'm looking at. But isn't that what abstraction is? Abstracting something that you're looking at. I mean, nature is very abstract, really. It's. Um, Again, it's all about gesture and mark making. And to me, these are trees are paint strokes and, and big areas of foliage are big splashes of paint. And 
keeping it on the surface. That's interesting to me. Like I said, I love Neil Welliver. I love Fairfield Porter. Neil Welliver used to go out into the woods and do a very small painting of what he was looking at and then take it back and do the drawing on the canvas and then just work from the corner one from like the left corner down to the right corner and finish it. But he'd already seen it and felt it and he had absorbed it into his psyche, I guess. And he was able just to knock it out. I, I can't paint like that. I, I have to respond directly to what I'm seeing. It's almost like a happy accident with some control. So I, I would be bored if I had to go in and methodically put this down. But um, I did feel this one. I just felt it and it just came flowing out. I don't know why. Sometimes that happens. Want to do another? Yeah. Oh, this one. So this, this, <laughs> yeah, this came out of my Blair Witch obsession. Um, this is charcoal and white pastel. And I use the eraser a lot in my drawings to make line and to, to put something in and then erase it out and then put it back in and erase it out. It gives a really nice texture to the drawing and a sort of a depth and a and then you see those little spots of light up in the right hand corner. That's what I'm talking about where I erased out the light and then I went in with white pastel to really make a pop because that was the dark space back there. You don't really know what's in the woods. It's a little bit scary and I like that. I did a whole series of black and white woods drawings where, um, well, you have to push, well, they were, if you saw Blair Witch, they were lost in the woods and it's just a little bit scary and I like that. So that's what this is. The Blair Witch Woods, I guess. And, but it's really the woods in its natural state in the fall for the winter <laughs> where or at, at nighttime. Also the flashlight thing where the flashlight is right on the foreground and you're you're just, you can't get through. It's this maze and you can't get through. You have to really work to get into that space. I like that. It also makes a very abstract drawing. And there are my trees again that I brought up up front. I love those trees. And this this is another acrylic painting. This, this is also acrylic. I did this drawing first in charcoal and then I decided to bring the color in. I mean, it's just the uh, trees live in communities. This is a little community of trees. They're friends, they, they side by side. They have this grouping, you know, when you, build a big house and you tear down all the trees, but you leave maybe one, that tree is going to die. And I've tested this in my neighborhood because everybody keeps tearing down the houses or the trees to build houses. And the tree that they leave always dies because they're in communities and they feed each other and they nurture each other. And without that, they either suffocate or they get too much water or they something happens to those remaining trees. And you see trees in groves, you see them uh, growing and they know what they're doing. Nature is very um, knowledgeable about itself. I don't think we are. But anyway, these two trees are friends to me. I should have titled it friends, but that's what they are. They were right outside my window. So that was important and I don't know, I just wanted to do a big vertical statement. And then this is a totally different I think I wanted to make this pretty. I don't know why, but it's spring. It's a different time. And then I think I added the blue to make it pretty. <laughs> Sometimes you just get an emotional feeling and you try something. If it's working, great. But it started out as a drawing and then I started adding color. And you can see a lot of color in the trunks. I'm struggling to find those tree colors again the oranges and the purples and the yellows and they're that's that's just an investigation i think trees are beautiful so that's my spring piece the things are starting to bloom this is definitely wisconsin in the winter this is that's where this inspiration came from there was so much snow and the linear quality of nature just mesmerized me i love doing this this is my favorite thing i do a lot of ink drawings like this um, trying to get those lines and, and how they connect to each other and overlap each other. And how do you make space by just lo using line and density? I, um, this piece means a lot to me and I look at it a lot. I still have it. I've never done a painting from it, 
because I think it's complete just the way it is. But that's what this is about, that really cold, dark winter that went on from snow in Wisconsin, it's like October to May, you were constantly cold. And so that was, so again, it's like where I am and what I'm doing inspires some of the work. Oh, thanks Marjorie. Anyway, that's, that's 24 by 40, I guess. I have two pieces in that series, but I, I, again, it's all about the mark and making the space with just the mark. And there's no sun and it was cold and it's just another place that I've been. Next, oh, okay, so that's cut off just a little bit, but it's a watercolor. So I'm trying to get those grays and a limited palette watercolor. And I, I think this one, spoke to me the cold winter. This is recent up in um, New Jersey. And it's like, okay, the tree is there and the tree is not straight. And the if you notice the marks on my trees are going across the trunk, not going up and down. So I don't wanna make this too volumetric, but I, I give a little bit of that by making the mark. That's something I struggle with. like how much volume am I gonna go? I've done drawings that are very tight with volume. This one, and then there's that black tree in the foreground that comes across and kind of anchors everybody together. This is kind of like a community. Um, I'm really, I really loved the, the last few weeks of snowstorms out my window, it's beautiful. I'm sorry, I don't have the drawings to show you because they're a little bit different, but I was working in uh, ink and watercolor and I couldn't wait to get back upstairs for the next snowstorm because when the snow's coming down, it muted it. So the space was really flat and a lot of real subtle grays and it was really fun. So I, I can't say that I hated being inside. Actually, I've done more work this year during COVID than I have in my whole life because that's all you do. You know, you're, you're stuck at home. So you just keep drawing. I just brought my supplies home and I just kept drawing. I was drawing on everything. So that, it's good because it, it helps you think and you start working out new ideas and I've got a whole new thing going on that I have to work on as soon as I can get back to it. Yeah, but there's the warm and cool thing here and the um, flatness with a little bit of space. What is that, Georgia? She's giving you something. Okay, you can change it. It's about how um, trees communicate. Oh, okay. And this is another one where I didn't want to put everything in. Um, it, you know, sometimes it just feels right and you've captured the space. But I don't know how else to say it. It's a guttural thing. Um, again, it's that, I guess it's that overlapping right up front and then going back into the space. And they're not really trees anymore. They're just gray marks going into some yellow light. But there it is. That is a painting on a canvas where I actually had this as a drawing and then took it to the canvas with acrylic, which worked okay for me. But you also have to know when to stop. So you have to turn it upside down. Does it work? Is it sitting in the space? Um, when did I do this? Less, oh, in 2020, in 2020, yeah from the drawing. The drawing was done earlier, but then I decided I'm going to do this as a painting and see if I can make this work. I don't know. You know, you never know if it's really working, but something told me to stop. So I stopped and I didn't carry the green through it the whole way. And I didn't, I sort of like doing that because it kind of says I'm still a painting. I'm not, Nate, I'm not really a tree. <laughs> so, and then again, those, that struggle to find the purples with the yellows and the, the compliments mixed together to make your gray of the tree and getting lighter in value. So there still is a connection to the Renaissance idea of perspective because you know the contrast is in the foreground and then it gets closer in value as it moves back into space. And that creates the illusion of space. And there are all these techniques that we learned in school that artists use to create that idea of looking into a window into deep space. And so that's still in my head. And I, I like to try to break away from that a little bit, but it's hard because that was how I was taught and it was just, you know, beaten into my brain about what drawing was. So I try to use it, but not 
to the extent of making it so three-dimensional that it's like a photograph or a window. It's a different kind of window. And I also flatten it by going from the top to the bottom. That flattens it when the tree goes off the top because it brings it to the space of the front of the canvas, which is interesting to me. <laughs> Anybody have any questions while we're looking through this? Anybody? Oh, these are my dead sunflowers or almost dead sunflowers. This is uh, a 37 by 50 pastel drawing that, well, a little bit of charcoal and a lot of pastel. I love, I, again, I love using pastel because it's a real direct color application, but it's just very difficult to keep from smearing and, but it does lend itself to the way I think about space. It works. And this was a field that I pass by a lot. And so I did photograph this field because I couldn't sit there. So it's a little bit of an imagination thing because I photographed it, went home, did the drawing and then thought, you know what, I'm gonna add red into this. It really wasn't red. So, but the green and the red, it, kind of worked for me, but it was, they were, they had lost all of their leaves or their petals and they were starting to die. And I found that beautiful. So there you have it, the dying sunflowers up in Northern New Jersey on those fields. They have those sunflower mazes. Oh, and this piece, again, this was that summer thing. You can see, I, I didn't even realize when I put this show together that I was doing seasons. I have winter, summer, autumn, <laughs> I have every season in here. But again, that was up, you know, and by the lake and I'm painting directly on paper with acrylic paint on watercolor paper. So, and it's only 22 by 30 and it was done maybe in a day. You know, these things are done quickly to keep them fresh. But, um, and it's layered. I start with what's behind and then come forward instead of the other way around. Because then it layers the paint the way it's the way I see the layers, I layer the paint, if that makes sense sometimes. And then I don't know, that pink tree was yummy, so I left it pink. It really wasn't probably that pink, but it seemed to work for me. And it's gestural and flat. And I look at Fairfield Porter's color a lot. So I try to try to find that color, mixing my greens and my warms and my cools. Um, so there you have it. It's a happy summer painting, I guess. I have a question. Yeah. You use the word gesture many times. Yeah. Uh, gesture and mark making, and you just said the pink tree was gestural. What do you mean by that? Well, gesture is what something is doing, not what it really looks like. So the gesture of the tree, the way it grows, the way it moves through space, the gesture of the leaves, um, it's not um, the outline of something. It's not uh, the way the dancer looks, but it's the movement of the, of the dancer. To me, the gesture is the way the thing is moving in space. So it's essence or it's dance movement or it's direction or we did a lot of gesture drawings in college and it had to do with what the figure was doing, not what it looked like. So that became my way of seeing. And that's how I think of nature in its gestures, as opposed to, I mean, these trees don't look like that. They're just marks of paint, but they cap, I'm trying to capture what they're doing. They're growing up or they're turning or they're, there's tension close together or they're layered or all those things. Does that make sense to you? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, gesture was a big deal in college. Be, I would have a figure drawing class and the figure would be leaping around the room, this naked old lady. She would actually leap from desk to desk and that's what we were supposed to draw. Well, you can't draw the outline of a lady leaping. You have to draw what she's doing. So then you, your mark making became general I want gestural marks about how she was moving from table to table. And we learn to see that. And then you go back. And if you want to get into her details of her face and the way she really looks in her hair, yes, but it's on top of what she's doing. So 
it's like the dancer, you don't really see their face, but you see the movement that they're making in space. When I was in high school, I took a dance class at the University of Evansville and it was uh, based on Martha Graham and she was all about movement and gravity. And I think that really stuck in my mind. It's, it is about gravity. The gravity is holding the trees, the gravity is part of nature. And the way we move is affected by gra gravity. So that gestural thing is part of that. That was a big influence to me. My mother told me I had to make a decision. Either I was gonna be a dancer or I was gonna be an artist. So I picked the artist. I took classes all the time at the university, watercolor classes as a high school student. And I, you know, again, I told you I love to draw but she made me make a choice. Maybe that was a better choice because dancers don't have a career that lasts that long. But um, I loved dance. I love movement and, and ballet and, and modern dance. It was modern dance. And we would move across the gym, uh, the gym floor with no, no, nothing on our feet. And it was all about movement. And I had a partner, you had a partner and you had to move together. There had to be uh, a sense of, the other person, like the two trees together and how the air was around your body and how you move together. Maybe that had some influence on this work. I just thought of that right now since you asked me that question. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff from your childhood comes back later, right? It comes around and, and you think, wow, that was always in there, but I didn't know that. <laughs> You know, are you are because artists are like sometimes forced to make up stuff about their work and they don't really know because it's in, inside. But you have to learn to speak and and be able to communicate in other ways besides visual. Um, this is another summer piece, obviously. The same series, same time outside, painting away, working on it, trying to get those spaces in between the leaves. I like those spaces in between the leaves of the sky or whatever that was, the negative spaces, making them positive, yet staying in their place where they belong in the, Patricia, in the composition. Patricia, I have a question. Um, sometimes you seem to push the abstract quality more than other times. Mm -hmm. Are you doing that consciously? Yes, I. you know what happens to me? Because my training was so intense, I sometimes get caught up in, um, really detailed drawing. And I, I know that's okay, but it bothers me. I, I like to push myself. So it takes a long time to get to this. Uh, so yeah, I do it intentionally to see if I can break away from some of those rules because I was brought up with a lot of rules in my house and in my education. So I try to push it to see if I can go somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> I just looked at some Welliver uh, pieces and it seems like they seem contrived compared to your work. Well, that's what I was saying. I can't work like that. He is contrived. That's why I was saying, you know, how he works from one corner to the other. I, I don't work like that. Like I'm more gestural. <laughs> There's my word. This one, this is the wind. This one is uh, charcoal and um, gesso on a canvas. And I like this one. This is more what, how I see things, I think. This goes back to that other one in Wisconsin that I, you know, the drawing. Yeah, there's more of um, a felt sense of place. That's the best way I can put it. That's the best way I can put it. As opposed to contriving and, and building it um, in a mechanical way, I can't do that. I don't cook. I don't use a recipe when I cook. Does that explain it? I like to feel and sense the ingredients and put them together. I mean, maybe I'll start off with the recipe, but it doesn't always go there. And my, the most fun in the kitchen is to open the refrigerator and say, okay, what are we going to have tonight? And I just pull out what I have and make something. That's kind of how I work. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Mom. Thank you everybody for coming. And I hope, I hope you understood what I was saying and you learned something. <laughs>